on this regularly scheduled meeting of Bridgewater Town Council to order. Uh, the agenda has been circulated. You'll note that there's an addition um, about uh, a purchase at 132 St. Phelps Street, and that is going to be down under new business later on in the agenda. Um, with that, can I please have a motion to approve the uh, agenda as amended? So sure. moved. <laughs> Councillor McGinnis, seconded by Councillor Thorburn. All those in favor? Thank you very much. Um, are there any announcements? Any upcoming events? Anything on the go? Councillor Thurber? I guess a big one, and, and I think it's the ninth annual Relay for Life on June the 2nd, Friday night. And uh, it certainly is a very important event for research and, and to help the survivors. And I hope that as many people can show up and support a great cause. Thank you. Councillor Graves. And on Thursday, uh, June 8th, between 4 and 8 p.m., the United Way at Lunenburg County Bike for Kids program has uh, is giving away 68 bikes to kids and, and family members that need them. These bikes are free. And if you're interested in getting one, just contact Heather Hanlon in Parks and Recreation in the town of Bridgewater, and she'll hook you up with one. We, right now, we have 29 bikes left to give away. Fantastic. And I know we normally talk about things that are upcoming, but uh, Councilor Thurman, do you want to just maybe quickly mention the... Uh, Biannual event. Oh, the 53rd Biannual yeah. Legion Convention. Yeah, that was held uh, last Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. And uh, there was 203 delegates, 20-some uh, observers, and their families in town for that weekend. And it, they were very appreciative of the cenotaph and, and uh, very impressed, to say the least. And they mentioned it numerous times from Nunavut Command, Chair, President. And it was a great weekend, a lot of collaboration, and uh, really went well. Um, this morning I had the privilege of attending a funding announcement made by the federal government through their um, New Horizons program of $25,000 for the Lunenburg County 55 plus games. So that is the maximum that you can get through that program. So uh, congratulations to that group for obviously putting in a great application and uh, for what will be a fantastic event. With over a thousand participants in, uh, in the fall in our, in our region. So town and uh, all of Lunenburg County will be hopping um, come September. Um, we have, uh, we're a little early, but we have a delegation for South Shore Tourism. And uh, welcome. Thank you. Give me your presentation and we'll just turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me. My name is Joanne Cooper. I'm the general manager for the Best Western in Bridgewater. I also am part of the South Shore Tourism team. Um, I do appreciate you getting us on the agenda uh, this evening. Um, I am aware that our funding request for South Shore Tourism uh, is not, has not been approved for the current budget. After having some discussions, just thought maybe it would be a good opportunity to get in front of the group and um, sort of explain, I guess, what we've done, what we've done in the past, what our plan is for the next couple years. Um, of course, uh, at the end of the day, I will hope, I do hope that you get some insight into tourism on the South Shore and what the team does and possibly reconsider the funding request for the South Shore tourism team. But we will give you an overview of um, what we've done in the past, sort of where we're headed. The presentation, I'm going to try to flip through it quickly because I know I'm on a limited time. Um, I'm sure if there's questions at the end, uh, there's some time allotted for that as well. Um, so. The South Shore Tourism team has been going for probably, I'm going to say four or five years. It's a completely volunteer working group. There's a list of uh, the current group um, that's working on the project right now. Basically, the overall goal is South Sh of South Shore Tourism team is to increase tourism revenue along the South Shore. That's our, that's our one and only goal. Um, we have some uh, municipal partners and members on the team. We have some industry partners on the team. It's a small working group. Um, hopefully you'll see through the, uh, the presentation that we do uh, put in a lot of time and effort into increasing revenues for the South Shore. Um, and of course, uh, we're always open to having anybody who wants to help out and sit on the team and, and help us work through our agenda is always, is always welcome. Um, I think the benefits of growing tourism are pretty self-explanatory. Of course, some of the highlights being the tourism industry affects, touches so many other industries and businesses in the area. So of course you have the accommodations, uh, restaurants, 
um, construction, maybe of new facilities, maybe new roads, maybe new shops, uh, retail, the um, sort of age old saying that you can't sort of, you can't pass through without getting gas, without having to stop at uh, a sporting store, maybe to get, um, maybe to get a new helmet, maybe to get something fixed. So there's a lot of impact of tourism on the, uh, bringing tourism and growing it. Um, of course, the tax revenues generated from tourism. We hope that it will be, um, it can be used towards provincial-wide initiatives like increased air access to be able to get, the more people that want to come here, the more, um, the more investment is going to be made in access to the province. Uh, new business investment, of course, it's pride of place when you have events such as the 55 plus games or anything else that's going on in the area. Uh, people really get behind those and those are those are part of um, tourism and it really gives an increased pride of place and community. And um, just the more attraction, the more we invest, the more attractions we bring, the more activities, the more that we can uh, continue to sustain a uh, viable industry. So, like I said, we have we are four years in. Um, it was South Shore Tourism team was sort of uh, sort of came together with some people sitting around a table, going, "Hey, um, Destination Southwest Nova no longer exists. There's nobody doing anything as a collaborative effort in the area." Uh, so we sort of literally sat around a table and said, "You know what? We need to do something. We need to make sure that we're going out as a united front as the South Shore," and that's how it all started. 2015-2016, uh, we, um, not that we became more formal, but we did have a very much of a marketing plan because we asked for some uh, contributions from partners as well. So we did launch a successful digital survey search campaign with Tourism Nova Scotia. Um, I usually have somebody with me in this who knows the numbers a little bit better, but I'm flying solo today. Um, so basically it was a dollar match value. South Shore Tourism team put in a dollar amount Tourism Nova Scotia matched it. Um, it was all digital, so it was all search word campaign and ad and um, sort of that uh, search engine optimization for the South Shore. Uh, we did hire a promotions coordinator to assist us with uh, the digital search campaign. Also, NovaScotia.com was one of our bigger um, initiatives. I hope that everybody here has been on NovaScotia.com at some point. We decided not to do our own website. NovaScotia.com is a world-class website. It has international attention. Tourism Nova Scotia is driving people to that website every time they're out in the industry. So we said, hey, why, why are we going to try to make our own website, invest money into it, have to management, manage it? Let's make NovaScotia.com the very best that it can be. So that mean, meant reaching out to operators, making sure their pictures were up there, their hours of operation, bringing everything together, making sure links were active. So we spent a lot of time on NovaScotia.com because that's our, that's where we're driving people and that's, um, that's where tourism is, is starting when people go out and look to come to Nova Scotia. A lot of, lot of uh, concentration on social media. Cooperative marketing, we don't have a budget to do ads. So basically what we say is we find the opportunities and then we'll go out to our group and say, hey, who wants to be in the Boston Herald? It's gonna cost, if we get six partners, it's gonna be 400 bucks each. Um, here's the spread and we get a little blurb. So these people have ads, but the blurb is always uh, South Shore inclusive. So we don't talk about those four advertisers. We talk about the South Shore. They sort of help um, boost, boost what we can invest in it. Uh, I'll leave some of these here. I think I might be one short. Uh, we do produce and edit these. Well, uh, Metro Guide Publishing produces it, but we do all the editing and give all the information so for the South Shore Guide as well. Um, I think you guys might be short of views. <laughs> so, uh, have a look through it. It's a great guide. Basically, it's once people get to the province, the Doers and Dreamers is used to get them you know, people who are coming to Nova Scotia, where are they gonna go? Once they land here, most areas have a guide such as this that kind of dives down a little bit deep, deeper into that area. So hey, maybe if they're only got a few days, maybe we can get them here instead of them going to the valley. And so this is sort of the, um, the information we give them. We do newsletters and we've started in some photo cataloging because uh, we need photos and we need media. And so we've started that too. Uh, this was our actual and budget for last year. Um, you see our, our revenues come from industry contributions and municipal contribu contributions. 
Um, we did have a little bit of a reimbursement uh, for an administrative reimbursement through a program that we partnered with uh, Tourism Nova Scotia on. And then below are our expenses. So there's the search engine optimization. We invested uh, 5750 um we, we invested 5000 for that program. Uh, Tourism Nova Scotia matched it, um, where we sort of cut based on not having the dollar figures that we had budgeted for and our net income on the bottom. So tourism um, generated $107, $187 million uh, in 2016 on the South Shore alone. It's 7% of the province's revenues in tourism, which was at $2.6 billion, I believe. Um, so after you run the numbers, tourism is actually one of our highest uh, revenue-producing industries on the South Shore. Um, these are mostly generated... Uh, there's a breakdown in a slide a little bit further on about where these numbers are gathered from. Um, but it is, I, I think on the South Shore, the last figure we have, it's the highest industry on the South Shore when it comes to revenues. Our goal, the ga that orange line is where capacity is right now for rooms. We do need to base our number on room nights because it's the most hardcore data that we have. It's hard to get reporting. All of accommodations are required to report our room nights, so it's a good indicator of where we are. The orange line is our room nights. The line above it is how many room nights we have available in the area. It goes up and down because some are seasonal, so we have more rooms available in the summer. Our goal is to close that gap. We want to see that gap really, really small. We want to see those lines come together. If we can get people to stay here for an increased number of times, again, they're using the restaurants, they're doing retail, they're buying gas and all that sort of good stuff. Uh, there is a big focus. Those gaps are bigger on the ends, so on the winter season. So you'll see in our plan for this coming year, we really have a focus on driving tourism in our off season. Um, we don't need to drive a lot in July and August where people are running 96% occupancies, um, but we do need it in those in those shoulders, and that's our opportunity. And we want uh, Donna from White Point will always say the line, you know, uh, no one ever asks her if she's open in the summer. She gets the question all the time if they're open in the winter. We want everybody to know that the South Shore is definitely open for business in the winter. I'll, room night sold. Uh, it's uh, it's explanatory. Um, January is an interesting one. You'll see that little that little blip in the orange on the end. Um, so that's probably a couple thousand, uh, probably about a thousand or so. Sled chalky in January of last year. The big orange one is from the curling event we uh, in Liverpool in 2014. So those events again show a really big peak. Um, campgrounds. Again, you sort of see that peak in August, and of course they're they're seasonal, so um, they they ramp up quite a bit. Uh, but again, we're we're coming off of one of our best tourism years, especially for the peak season. Visitor information sites. Again, I'm just running through these. Uh, there are stats that we've collected. We're not sure what happened in 2014 that everybody decided to go to the VICs, but there was some sort of um, some sort of blip there for some for some reason. The 2016 numbers do not include October. Uh, increase in organic search for Nova Scotia South Shore. So we use NovaScotia.com slash South Shore to drive all of our business and all the campaigns that we do. Um, this is also where we would have used that search engine optimization money that we had last year to drive business and to make sure that we were we are popping up on on searches so um so you can see the increase in sessions there from 2015 to 2016 as well tourism numbers um i really like this slide as a accommodation operator because everybody is very quick to say oh it's the hotels for accommodations the tourism revenues by sector from Tourism Nova Scotia are noted down there in, in the corner uh, with restaurants at the top of the list, vehicle operation, transportation, and then accommodations with regards to revenue. So again, it shows the impact of where that $2.6 billion in 2016 uh, goes within the industry. Um, it's definitely more than the accommodations that, uh, that benefit from this, of course. Um, accommodations at 15, shopping's no joke at 14%, so, and, and right down the line down to um, local transportation and rentals. Uh, we do get a nice um, 
we do get a nice chunk of what's coming in. Uh, we'd like to get more. We'd like to certainly like to pull the folks that are headed to the valley down down our way as well. We'd love to be on a level someday to compete with Cape Breton and uh, pull that that uh, industry here as well. So our marketing plan for 2017 and 2018, um, the same type of thing, digital, print, trade shows, partnerships. Uh, we do, I think there was something like over 500 um, travel media reports that in 2016 that were circulated uh, talking about uh, operators on the South Shore. Um, so everything from the Boston Globe to um, independent writers to bloggers. Uh, and a lot of that does go through South Shore Tourism. Again, it's something that comes through us and we push out to our operators and say, hey, look who's coming. Do you want to jump on board? Do you, wanna, do you have anything to offer these travel writers? They come, they write the best advertising you can possibly have for the area. These are pretty well what we're focusing on, uh, digital and print. Uh, we wanted to do the digital marketing campaign again this year. Unfortunately, we have cut it from our budget because we didn't get the funds that we had hoped for. So um, we made the decision to put our money into a person rather than the digital because we really need to keep, um, we really need some help. Again, we're a volunteer board. We're short on hours. We need some help and we need, uh, we need NovaScotia.com to stay uh, sort of pristine. Cooperative marketing will always push out those opportunities to others to um, to collaborate and come in on an ad. Uh, we do we do do a lot for organizing um, saltscapes. Uh, we have um, helped organize the South Shore for the South Shore Expo. Rendezvous Canada and Atlantic Canada Showcase are two bigger industry trade shows that don't always happen in Halifax. They are rotating through here in the next couple years, so um, we're working on those to make sure that the South Shore has a big contingent in those as well. Travel media um, and influencers, so we're trying to write, we try to push out press releases, make sure that we stay front and center with regards to what's happening in tourism, inviting travel writers, um, Go Media Canada, which is a uh, travel media tour that's going along, that's coming as well. Um, four season attractions. So we've started on these. We've started on planning for a winter festival that will happen after Christmas. Um, happen in the February-ish months. Again, to drive sort of tourism in that need month. Uh, planning started for that last month. Um, and also doing a push, uh, trying to take a Christmas festival as well, running from the end of November to New Year's, or actually, I think it, I think we said Old Christmas Day, January the 6th, so sort of packaging that as a deal uh, for everybody and pushing it out and saying, hey, come to the South Shore for Christmas. We're open. This is what you can do. Same thing for February. Um, we're actually looking at, uh, we want to we wanna do a lobster fest in the winter. Um, lobster season is open in the winter. We have fresh lobster. Um, nobody, you know, we can really push that. We kind of want to do it like a a burger week for lobster rolls and lobster celebrations and it's going to be all about lobster uh, and that will be sort of our push for February. There is a lack of uh, training and HR resources. Um, um, tourism operators are struggling for staff right now. We're struggling for qualified staff. We're struggling for uh, qualified workers that will stay with us year round and not having turnover. Um, there was a online job ad that went out recently that I think advertised 160 something, 166 tourism jobs for the South Shore for the summer months. So uh, we're trying to, ma again, make sure that we're collaborative in supporting the industry in that fashion as well. Implementation, we have decided to officially become an organization and we're doing it as a cooperative um, where we have partners paying in and we all sort of put money in the pot and it pays out to different, uh, different programs. Um, we are partners with, uh, we do partner qu closely with the, the REN, Tyans, the different chambers, the municipalities. Um, we're constantly pushing out communication with our partners. We are, we are committed to measuring and monitoring our progress. So there's always a report at the end that says where we started, where we're going, uh, where we've ended up and how we got there. We're happy to do that report at any time to any of the municipalities, any of our partners, anybody who needs that information. We do have sessions frequently that update on this. So we always, we're always having gatherings and at every, 
every sort of gathering that we have, we um, re report on where we have come and where our money has been spent and what the impact of that has been. This is our budget for this year. It's um, pretty simple, <laughs> pretty to the point. Uh, the uh, Tourism Nova Scotia Digital Program was one of the things that we wanted to do. Actually, sorry, it's for 2017 and 2018. Again, as of now, we've cut it for 2017. Um, revenue with municipal investments. We have been quite, we do use the REN formula just because that when we started, we tried to do this in absence of, um, again, a marketing agency. So there was talk about the REN taking tourism and going with it. So that we kind of latched on to that REN formula and that's what we used last year. So we carried it forward for the next year or two. Um, and our partner investments uh, was what we needed. Uh, and our expenses on the bottom, so a project coordinator. Um, I think that's at about 20 to 20, I think it's 20 hours a week at $25 an hour maybe. Um, digital campaign, We again, we are becoming a corporation, so those are our big incorporation fees there for 2017 and 2018. And admin fees, so when it comes to the bank and bookkeeping, with our total budget being um, just under $41,000. These are our asks from the municipal partners. So request, again, we're doing it by the REN formula. Requested over two years the total, uh, what we're requesting each year, um, 2017 and 2018. There are, of course, equal amounts because the same formula is used for both, with the total on the bottom being uh, just over 16,000 from municipal partners uh, each year. The, again, the, the presentation, I do apologize, is a little bit old. Uh, we have had approval of the plan from our partners. We have taken the steps to uh, incorporate into a cooperative. Um, we did have a go, no-go date of April 15th. We didn't get the, the, the total investment that we were looking for from either the industry partners and the municipalities. So again, we have sort of cut a few things. We've cut some hours in the person to do the, uh, to do the work and we've cut the digital marketing program as well. That being said, um, even though we didn't get the funds, we sort of had a go, no go. If we didn't get the funds, we wouldn't be going, but we're still going. Um, we kind of, we always go. The people around the table are very invested in it. And, um, you know, the, we, I, we sell South Shore as a destination, as a total destination, and regardless of who buys in or who participates um, with regards to partners and areas, we, we sell the whole South Shore because we can't sell one part of it. And um, that's my presentation. Sorry if I talked really fast, but again, I know time's, time's ticking, so <laughs> sorry to blab that no, out. Thank you, Joanne. Any questions for Joanne? Deputy Mayor Tanner. Joanne, you've been running for four years, roughly. Yep. Have you been successful, and how do you measure that? Like, is it specifically just revenue calc, or? I mean, it is revenue, it is revenue calculation. Um, one of our big measurements for last year would have been the digital marketing campaign. So there was an increase in, um, in traffic that was seen through that South Shore page on NovaScotia.com, because that's where we invested a lot of, a lot of our, a lot of our money. Um, but yeah, it is just revenues because again, a lot of it it is cooperative marketing. So of course, a lot of ads and stuff they're kind of hard to to know where we get that where we get that in return on investment. We have we always do ask our partners to be ready to report to us at the end of the year of where, where how you did, how you felt this thing worked. Um, we haven't really gotten the feedback we've wanted. Again, you're pushing out to an operator who's really busy and looking for that information. You don't always get it. We are warning them prior this year that it's coming at the end of the year, so hopefully we'll get a little bit of better feedback from them. Uh, Councilor Graves. So I think that one of the earlier slides at the beginning, the, the, the revenue from the municipal units was $12,000, and the, the revenue from the, um, from the business community was only like eight. How do you motivate people in the business community to see that this is to their advantage? I think eighty-seven million dollars, a lot of money. And I think it is, it is a lot of money. <laughs> and you know, I think that comes from again, sort of staying the course. There was definitely a gap there where there was nobody out 
they're um, saying, hey, did you know that $187 million is generated through tourism and how important that is and how big that number is? Mm -hmm. uh, we can only, I mean, we can only motivate by, by making, that, um, making that information available. We, uh, we hold more and more gatherings. We're doing more training sessions. Um, we're really big advocates for it. So we, I mean, you know, as we're in our different organizations and talking, we're, we're certainly putting it out there. Um, I, think that's the, I think that's the whole thing. I think that's part of the problem is I don't think people completely understand what the value of, value of tourism is. And somebody needs to be there telling them that. So that's, that's hopefully what we're doing. Okay. Councilor McGinnis. Joanne, I, 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 I don't know how to start. Uh, I guess you do. <laughs> I, 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 at least seven or eight years ago, introduced the idea for the South Shore of something that every time I travel, no matter where it is, Halifax, mm -hmm. Ontario, BC, the States, there's something called a room. Yeah. For some reason, and I, no one's given me a good one yet, the so sure ignores that. Don't want to do it for some reason, and I, I don't understand those reasons. But I did some numbers. Mm -hmm. If we did a, a room levy just for our area, like Bridgewater and MODL, you get close to what seventy thousand dollars a year. Absolutely. So and that's not a tax. That's people coming to the area mm -hmm. that pay it. Usually it's only about a twenty. Or one or two percent, whatever the case might be. Right. And we refuse to do that. Uh, I think we're missing a huge opportunity, and it's, I think, the main reason why our council will not contribute uh, to the our organization, which is a wonderful organization mm -hmm. and needs all the help we can get. Absolutely. And it's right in your hand, and no one will do it. And it's not something new, it's something that's done all over. I, I can't find a hotel. Oakside, Lunenburg County, that doesn't charge it. I agree. Obviously, in the in the industry, in the accommodation industry, I understand room levies. I know that they're everywhere. Um, I, you know, I don't think that the South Shore Tourism team, as we sat down around that table and realized what needs to be done for the area, you saw our list of people and how much hours and time we put in to our own jobs, to, as I said, to Wayne coming in today, this is my third hat of the day for, for volunteering my hours. We All we want to do is promote the South Shore. I don't think it's in our hand to implement the levy. Um, this The South Shore, it runs from Hubbard's down to, I, I want to pull out the map and see, but down to Shelburne, down to Clark's Harbor. and. We have representatives that sit on the tie-ins board, and they're talking about levies at the provincial level. Um, I know the levies are being talked about in council. Um, I, I don't think it's on South Shore Tourism team. That's not what our mandate is: is to get the is to get the um, levy in. It's to go out and promote the value of the tourism industry. A supplementary. Yes. We. At least I, I've been told that, uh, that, that, that the Tourism Association does not want this. It would make them non-competitive. So you're saying if our council... We do not talk about the levy at the South Shore Tourism you should. level. We don't talk about it as something that we're going to implement or... But you should be lobbying for it. Um, again, that's not we're not we're not a lobby group. Our group is there to promote is to make sure that when uh, Nova Scotia Tourism is out promoting the area and they're sending someone to NovaScotia.com that everybody is showing up on NovaScotia.com that businesses from Bridgewater, whether Bridgewater contributes or not, are showing up on NovaScotia.com that they have pictures on NovaScotia.com that their links are working that you're coming to Nova Scotia come to the South Shore because it's the best place in Nova Scotia to come. That's what our mandate is. Councilor Thurburn. Is that picture in Shelburne? Looks like it. <laughs> um, it's got to be because that's uh, the setting for the movie that was there. We're, we're, we're a cooperative team. Yeah. Someone else did the background for yeah. the <laughs> But I, I did uh, bring it up at the Ravenna about the levy because 
using the numbers that you've shown today, 172,000 room lights is $342,000. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a fair amount of money. And I was talking to Michael this morning, not even considering this, but he was down to the states and there they pay, have a paid a state tax of $4.62, a city tax of $3.85. Having and a more tourists that seems to be reluctant to want to put money in to invest in their own industry. Then I look at the formula, and I understand the use of the REN formula, but I look at the communities that benefit the most from tourism pay the least because they are the smallest communities. And that's, that's been brought up, and we've, we've rec we recognize that, and we have talked for going forward that we would relook at the use of the REN, the REN formula and look at the communities and who's benefiting from tourism. Again, it was um, that part was sort of done with regards to a few people that a few of the um, economic development officers and that's sort of where that piece all came again we tried to get it back out this year we went with that formula it worked for us last year it has been brought up as a concern and it is something that we're that we are looking at for for future i think it's probably wise that the, the councils of the region get together and discuss the room levy together because I, I I think I, I, I believe think that's where the, so that's, that's where, where it needs to start this has to come from it has yep. to come from us and then that would give you a sustainable pot of money mm -hmm. to invest in the resources absolutely in order to get that there uh, Councilor Thorburn just want to thank you for the presentation it was very informative and, and what I'm seeing there is that there's three or four more areas that's that's really benefiting from having tourists in the area not just the rooms Oh, absolutely. It's, it's, a, it's a the grocery huge. Store. So to target one group and not distribute that fairly uh, seems like an injustice. Thank you. Councilor McGinnis. Is there a solution to the labor issue? That's a big issue. Don't it think? is a big issue. Um, Nova Scotia Community College pulled the program from um, Bridgewater. Um, their tourism program. There is talks of bringing it back in, so they've kind of pulled it. They've done a re, re look at the whole program, why it wasn't working, um, why people were leaving it, why they weren't working in the area. So that actually is underway, and we're expecting that program to come back in 2018 or 2019, which is a huge boost for us. It gives us qualified workers that live here that want to. It's hard to attract somebody from Halifax to come down and work um, in, a, in a small hotel in Bridgewater when this is what they've chosen for their career. Uh, so we're hoping this will you know, have some people that are sort of uh, grow, grown up in the area that have some investment in the area and wanna work and live here. Um, you know, there's seasonal jobs. Again, that, that's the other thing about that shoulder season and getting the winter season to be um, as producing as the summer because then we can say, hey, you know what? You're not going to be laid off in in uh, February because we have a big February coming and we're going to have jobs. So um, expanding that season and is re would really help us in sustained workers because we get them for the summer, things slow down, they go and look for other work because we can't sustain the full staff the full year, the full year round. You know how you expand that season? Hmm. Room levy. <laughs> the room levy's not gonna expand the season. Yes, it is. No, and it, it's, not my, it's not my place to, to <laughs> argue that. Putting people out there and saying that we're open and that this is a great place to come in the winter will expand that season. It's getting the resources to adequately market the mm -hmm. region. Yeah. I love the idea of a lobster festival. Oh, I love that. That's an ingenious idea. Yeah. Yeah. Great idea. Yeah. Yeah. Now, that, was a, that was a fantastic presentation. Especially, I, I like the stats with yeah. where accommodation mm -hmm. came in the... Well, it's easy to say, you know, again, I work in accommodations. It's very easy to say, yeah, well, you know, you work in accommodations. and But there's a whole other, there's a slew of businesses that are directly affected with an increased number of tourism tourists in the area. That's great. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? Thank you very much. No? Thank you, Joanne. Thank you. Do we have any other speakers? If you'd like to come to the podium, <coughs> introduce yourselves, please. Mr. Mayor, Honorable Councillors, my name is David Truman, and I'm here with my dad, Hazen Truman, and we're here uh, representing Lana Thai Kitchen on King Street in downtown Bridgewater. Uh, we're not so much of the presentation, but we are here with regards to the sidewalk bylaw um, that's as part of the agenda tonight. 
Uh, we want to be on public record uh, urging the importance um, and the urgency of this bylaw uh, to come into effect. Um, until it does come into effect, we'll be unable to uh, approach for a liquor license, which will also impact our ability to get people out front um, of our building, um, which will limit our ability to increase business, um, but not just our business. Um, the sidewalk bylaw is for all businesses in town. Um, so while it directly ben could benefit us, um, it does also, uh, it's in the interest of anybody else with the business or potential business in town. Um, yeah, so we're, we're here to publicly support that. Um, <clears throat> our mayor and councillors have been presented with uh, diagrams illustrating minimal clearances and how they impact ours and other local businesses. And we thank you for your time last week and again tonight. We hope you share our passion and urgency by passing a sidewalk bylaw, one that will help our contribution in making a pedestrian King Street possible. Thank you. Um, does anyone have any oh, questions? questions? Just would you take questions if anyone has? Sure. Them? Sure. Yeah. Any questions for anyone? Mm -hmm. No. Cool. Yeah. I think everybody received the information yeah. last week, yep. and uh, yeah. we yep. just wanted to make sure we were here for yeah. for support of that. But uh, any questions now or any time, you know where to find us. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Our next item on our agenda are the minutes from April 10th and April 24th. Do you have those in your agenda? Package. Someone move the approval. Move the town council for the town of Bridgewater approve and confirm the minutes of the April 10th and April 24th, 2017 regular town council meeting as circulated. Seconder, please. Councilor Frazier, any questions, comments? No, hearing none. All those in favor? Motion is carried. Uh, our next item is our open space network plan update, and one of our planners, Jamie Allen, is. I guess <laughs> um, prepping a presentation. Council Thurber. Can you ask a question while we're waiting for her? You bet. What's the shortest time frame we can get this bylaw in place for to help the King Street business? Like, like I didn't want to ask, but how I long think the does one we're on, right? We, we did move it up in our agenda yes. um, to make sure it came this week. Um, but we are meeting the requirement, but I don't yes. think we can go any faster. Um, it depends a lot on advertising and deadlines. Um, so the soonest the second reading can take place after the first reading tonight is June 26th. Um, and then it has to be advertised. Once it's public, then it comes into effect. I can't tell you off the top of my head when that is, but it's into July. So part of our issue is the delay in we must advertise in a local newspaper. Local newspaper. And because our council meetings are at the beginning of the week and the local paper comes out at the beginning of the week, basically I'm on after each reading we we lose a week. And that's the requirement of the MGA as I understand it, that we have to have to put it in the local we can't put it online. Could we have a special meeting just to deal with that one item? That is to move the process. I'm just worried about the long time delay. We're into some time in July before they get started. They've lost a very big part of the summer season. Yeah, no, it's uh, a very valid point. I don't think it would make a lot of difference um, to hold a special meeting maybe a week. Yeah. Okay. We can, we can see in what it does save us for time. Yeah, I mean, when you, when you format the whole formula, by uh, having special meetings to deal with one issue, uh, I certainly think if, if it increases the, the time that they have to operate this year, it's, it's operation imperative. Yeah, understood, yeah. Do you have a question? Uh, and well, it was a thought, and I, I, at the risk of being having some stones thrown at me, <laughs> is the Chronicle Herald considered a local paper? Uh, that's a good question. What if it didn't have a weekly paper? So as we move through, hopefully, updates to the MGA, 
we should be lobbying with other municipal units Absolutely. to have the ability to advertise online or some other form of, of yeah. media so mm. that it gets out quicker. Yeah, okay, good. But, um, no, this is the dilemma, and now yes. we're gonna be in the summer, yes. Yeah. Right. Jamie Allen. Thank you. So I'm here to provide an update on the Open Space Network plan. It's been a little while since I've been to council to update you, but we've been working hard behind the scenes to get things going. So if you remember from my last presentation, we kind of had a vague working definition of open spaces, which included um, parks and some other spaces. We finalized our definition in <coughs> the Open Space Plan Advisory Committee, so we're coming here to council to see if you agree that this is a good definition. So our definition is open space is land or water that is accessible to the public and promotes sociability, leisure, connectivity, recreation or conservation, and that shapes the urban form in Bridgewater. So under this definition, there's lots of different kinds of space that, spaces that will be considered open spaces, including parks, of course, but also streets and sidewalks, bump outs like the new ones we have on King Street, community gardens, rivers and brooks, trails, sports fields, the outdoor pool, and conservation areas. It also includes land that is privately owned but publicly accessible, even if that land isn't always publicly accessible. So for example, the grounds around the LCLC, pathways across private land, and parks inside land lease communities would all be included as open spaces under this definition. So some of the conversations that we had at our committee level included whether we should include totally private spaces as open space, so private yards, for example, and also whether we should include indoor spaces. And we decided that we would not include those spaces in our definition of open space. So if you remember from our definition, we talked about how open spaces shape the urban form. So what does that mean exactly? So sometimes we think about what is outside of buildings being kind of determined by where the buildings are placed. But I guess we're suggesting that we should flip that on its end and say that we should decide what we want our open spaces to look like first and then decide based on that where we place our buildings around them. So the shape, frequency, size and open spaces has a lot of effect on the public realm. Um, it includes things like determining how much parking we need, how walk because that will determine how walkable a space is. Um, it'll determine how big of a yard people need in their backyard and whether they, cho they choose to have one or not. Maybe they won't if they have a really great public open space close by. Um, it determines commercial and residential densities, so that affects things like the cost of providing infrastructure and streets. And how buildings are set back from the street and each other can be very important because not only does that determine how much land a building is taking up, but it includes things like how welcome pedestrians feel on the sidewalk and how the space is framed. So the first thing that we did was we talked about the public interest and why do we care about the public interest? Well, the first reason is because I'm a planner and I'm required to consider the public interest but based on the code of conduct for my um, profession. Planners practice in a manner that respects the diversity, needs, values, and aspirations of the public, as well as acknowledge the interrelated nature of planning decisions and the consequences for nature and human environments. So when we're talking about the public interest, we're really thinking about those fundamental principles that should be common to our whole community. But of course, we're all different, so there isn't one single public interest. And we need to talk about them and make sure we're clear about what these are and what we're basing our decisions on because that provides an opportunity for people to comment and point out if we're missing something, for example. Um, making sure that we're thinking about everybody and what our, uh, what our our common interest for a great open space network. So when we're talking about the public interest in this sense, we're talking about the public interest for why. Why do we care about open spaces to begin with? So the ones that we've come up with, that we're hoping that you agree that these are kind of the foundation of our plan. So equality, health, nature, connectivity, place, and good governance. So based on those, we've come up for a vision for what our open space network plan is supposed to accomplish. So if you think of our plan as a roadmap, the vision is the destination. Where are we going with our plan? Our network of open spaces provides inviting places for people to gather, exercise, find locally grown food, and connect with nature. Our community is connected by welcoming sidewalks, trails, streets, bridges, and the La Haye River, making it easy for people of all ages and abilities to move about. Our beautiful open spaces attract visitors to our town and are a source of pride for our community. They provide wildlife habitat and contribute to the health of the La Haye River watershed. So drilling down from there, we've established nine objectives 
Um, so when we were talking about the public interest, we were talking about open spaces and why they are important, but now we're talking about the plan itself. What are we trying to accomplish with the plan? So we're going to identify gaps in the open space network, identify barriers to open space use and promote inclusivity, establish a, a framework for prioritizing open space investment, identify opportunities to improve physical connections between open spaces to pr promote active transportation choices, identify opportunities to improve social connection and access to nature, influence decisions for enhanced ecosystem health, identify opportunities to improve access to food grown in open spaces, identify opportunities to raise awareness and increase use of open spaces, and fo foster partnerships to build capacity. So what we're hoping for tonight is Council's endorsement of the proposed definition, the shared values of the public interest, the vision, and the plan objectives. And we also have plans to come to a discussion session on June 19th, so that's, that, that, that date's a little bit different than what was in the report, but we are still planning on coming just a little bit later. And then we can have a broader discussion about the strategic directions of our plan, which would kind of be more concrete actions that would be flowing out of our objectives. So I'm happy to take any questions, if anybody has any. Questions from councillors, Councillor Graves. So does the plan include tree canopies and trees? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. The, uh, they actually fit into a number of different um, objectives, um, but basically um, improving walkability, making it more comfortable. Obviously, they uh, provide wildlife habitat, help with stormwater management, heat island effects. They're a big one, absolutely. Any other questions? <coughs> yes. Someone prepared to make a motion? I would move that Town Council for the Town of Bridgewater endorse the proposed definition of shared values of the public interest vision and plan objectives for the open space network plan as outlined in document 17-084. Uh, Seconder, Council McDonald, any further discussion? No. I just have a question um, as far as setting the priorities mm -hmm. um, when when you're you have your objectives, but I'm just wondering how do you determine uh, the priorities as to um, what what action you're going to take and how do you look at those? Are some of them maybe around safety or if you could just maybe yep. elaborate a little bit there? So we're going back to our our public interests. Right. Um, so we've been talking about um, at the staff level and also with our, our advisory committee what we're calling strategic directions and we're trying to keep the number of strategic directions fairly small because we want this to be a plan that's manageable in the short term and we want it to be have something that we can bite into right away and not something that's going to take 20 years to accomplish. So what we're trying to do with the strategic directions is they're not they're not competing with each other. So for example, maybe street trees would be uh, one strategic direction to come up with a plan and a strategy for street trees. And then we might, we might also have a different strategy um, that talks about um, what kinds of parks need to be invested in as a priority. Um, so we're trying to address all of the different objectives with our strategic, strategic directions, but not the strategic directions would kind of each have its own little area that it's meant to address. Although some of them are coming that really address a lot of different ones, like the street trees. Thank you. Councilor Sorry. Just a question in regards to the, some of the roads, when we're building some of the streets and the newer streets, and I'm referring specifically to power lines, mm -hmm. so would the encouragement of having some of those buried to make the street look better be part of this? It could be. Um, so I look at um, Aberdeen, going up Aberdeen. It's it's a mess in terms of where all the wires are and the, mm -hmm. the poles, and that might be a, a street that might benefit from that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's not one that's had a lot of conversation, to be honest, and okay. it's not one that came out of the, the community engagement that we were doing last summer, but certainly something to think about, especially when you consider in the space on the sidewalk and things, other things that we might want to happen on the sidewalk, and if the, there's space being taken up by power poles and maybe we won't have the opportunity to do that, like, like lighting or street trees, for example. Yeah. yeah. It wouldn't be every yeah, street. It would only be selected. Some key ones. Yep. Yeah, that's certainly what we're thinking about for sure. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? There's a motion on the table. Ready for the question? Question. Question is being called. All those in favor? 
motion is carried. Thank you. Uh, reports and recommendations. First reading of the proposed sidewalk cafe bylaw. And uh, Ms. Wombold, are you here to discuss this? Sure, yeah, I can speak to, speak to the bylaw council. Okay. So essentially, uh, Bridgewater currently does not have a sidewalk cafe bylaw if passed. Um, so to go through the first reading and the eventual second reading. If passed, the legislation would enable businesses, which would encompass both food and or beverages, <laughs> beverage establishments, to have a sidewalk cafe associated with their business. So something actually on the outdoor public sidewalk. The way we would administer the bylaw would be to have an application from the food and or business establishment owner to go into our development officer. And that application would require a, a number of conditions which are outlined in the bylaw. Essentially, the maximum duration of that permit to operate the cafe would be from May 1st until October 31st. So it would be seasonal cafes and you would be allowed to operate that cafe within the hours of your regular business up to a maximum of 10 o'clock p.m. So if your business runs till 2, 2 a.m. for instance, up until 10 p.m. you could be operating the sidewalk cafe, um, you know, as you would your ordinary business, but after that period of time you would have to move indoors to your establishment. So when, you're, when a business decides to have or has the approval of having a sidewalk cafe on the sidewalk, the bylaw would require that they be able to achieve a pedestrian travel way on the sidewalk of the optimal distance of 1.8 meters. If that cannot be achieved, the bylaw allows for the traffic authority for the town of Bridgewater to conduct an assessment and uh, within his or her authority uh, and discretion uh, decide if a lesser condition could be met. Um, and there are instances in town where, where that may be feasible. If that is not an option, but the bylaw provides an alternative option of creating what is referred to as a temporary sidewalk you may be familiar with that in other communities where um, the, the business owner actually constructs a sidewalk, taking up a parking stall or two or three, and, and runs the sidewalk, and pedestrians are rerouted re re onto that temporary sidewalk until they're back on the, the main way. So the bylaw has um, a number of opportunities. To do that, there are a number of conditions for how temporary sidewalks are to be constructed, and building permits required, and a number of staff need to be involved in that in that process to ensure that it's a safe and appropriate travel way. That's essentially what the bylaw is trying to achieve. Um, there's also, there are provisions in the bylaw also for you know, uh, allowing staff and utility agencies access um, in, in the event that the cafe furniture, the cafe furnishings in general prevent any obstacle conditions in there that it must be removed if it's snowing outside, if we have some fluke snowstorm in October. <laughs> uh, so there's general provisions that we would expect as well as um, the ability for us to revoke a permit if it's necessary, if it's causing a public nuisance, along with some other conditions. That's the gist of the bylaw. Happy to answer any questions. Councillor Thorburn, perfect bylaw, I love it. Who, who enforces that bylaw? Because right now we don't have a bylaw enforcement officer. Is that another job added onto mm -hmm. our staff? Yes, essentially um, there are a number of bylaws that we don't have traditional enforcement for, so often the staff who are the administrators of that bylaw would, would do the enforcement. So as they come across the sidewalk cafe that they know that they did not provide a permit for, they would generally be the individuals to, um, to have conversation around. So, And there are a number of members on staff who would have the ability to issue a summary offense ticket if that's required. Sure. But these these types of bylaws um, are often dealt with just administratively and as a conversation or an education piece if somebody's operating um, a sidewalk cafe bylaw outside the outside of the provisions of the bylaw. Uh, sorry, I'm sorry, a sidewalk cafe outside the provisions of the bylaw. It's just often the case that they weren't aware that there were provisions and, and staff would work through the, that process. Okay. But yeah, our development officer, for instance, deals with a lot of the sign regulations and would likely be the first point of contact with dealing with any complaints on this bylaw as well. Okay, great, thank you. Any other questions? Someone care to just make a motion? Councilor Brazier? Uh, yes, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Town Council for the Town of Bridgewater endorsed the intent of the proposed sidewalk cafe bylaw as per document 17-081A and proceed to second reading of the bylaw at a council meeting to be held on June 26, 2017 and authorize staff to public all public notice notices pursuant to section 168 of the Municipal Government Act. Seconder, Councilor McDonald. 
I think this is a, another step forward to uh, revitalizing uh, King Street, especially. I know it applies to the whole town, but I think this yeah. is this is something that can really draw people to our downtown. Deputy Mayor Tanner. Well, we were looking at a smaller width. We we are, if yeah. if they need a smaller width, then they can come and um, speak to staff about that. That was the discussion that we that we had. Yeah, yeah. but only if they build an elevated public sidewalk. Not necessarily. So no, no, the no. section no. we'd okay. be interested in looking says um, fourteen subsection two: the minimum sidewalk width shall be one point eight meters unless otherwise approved by the traffic authority and the town engineer where yeah. a sidewalk cafe inhibits the minimum sidewalk with as determined by the traffic authority, the owner shall provide an elevated temporary public sidewalk. So if they can't, as determined by the traffic authority, so if you can't meet 1.8, yeah. the traffic authority will come and do a, you know, a site evaluation. And if a lesser, a lesser sidewalk width can, can be accomplished and still allow for safe pedestrian travel, then the traffic authority would approve it based on that description. If you can't achieve something that's still workable, then your only other option would be to do the temporary sidewalk. So the intention of the wording is to provide flexibility for staff to determine what would be appropriate for the given site. The way, sorry, uh, the way I read this is where a sidewalk cafe inhibits the minimum, not the way I am reading it, mm -hmm. it inhibits the minimum sidewalk width as determined by the traffic authority. So it, it's inhibiting the minimum width of 1.8. The, the owner minimum shall width provide. Am I missing something? The minimum sidewalk width shall be 1.8 meters unless otherwise approved by the traffic authority. So I think the intention of the wording, the way it's written, is then to carry that onward. So whatever, so let's say the traffic authority approves 1.6. Okay. Okay, which is for instance, where a sidewalk cafe inhibits the minimum sidewalk width as determined by the traffic authority. So if they're not able to maintain whatever that width was, 1.6 for instance, the owner shall provide an elevated temporary public sidewalk. So okay. the, ori the original wording said where a sidewalk cafe inhibits the minimum sidewalk width of 1.8. Now it says minimum sidewalk width as determined by the traffic authority. Yeah. Uh, I, see, I, I see where you're going. You almost yeah. want that first sentence to stop and then that second sentence to be mm -hmm. A. Yeah, okay. As long as we're all to, clear to on that. To yeah. ensure that we're moving through as quickly as possible. What I can do is I can get an opinion from the lawyer who, who has reviewed this, but specifically ask for that section to review the wording to ensure that it, it is saying Just what clear. we intend for it to say. Okay. With that. But you, you know the intention of, of counsel, right? I think that's that's yeah. clear and so. I guess if yeah. I'm confused, well, maybe I knew. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Easily Council, done. Counselor McDonald. <laughs> is that saying that any time the width is less than 1.8 meters and the traffic authority has approved that every time that happens there will be a temporary sidewalk or no, only if that no, is the only right way it could no. be yeah a temporary okay, sidewalk so is required <laughs> if you can't meet the minimum width as determined by the traffic authority but the minimum width isn't necessarily always 1.8 right no. if the traffic authority yeah, says it could be 1.3 because they can get a yeah. piece of machinery down mm -hmm. then 1.3 becomes the minimum width for that in front of that establishment Mm -hmm. It is a little confusing. Sure. So my, my fear is that you're currently the traffic authority still, right, Larry? Larry goes somewhere else because he's foolish and leaves the town of Bridgewater. Um, <laughs> but we get another traffic authority that just, you know, is, I don't know, what are not as forward thinking perhaps and reads that very differently, I guess. I, anyway. So if we approve this in first reading and we, we <coughs> kind of separate those two so they are very distinct. Because I understand the need for both, but to the deputy mayor's point, when you read it in one paragraph, it looks like they're connected. Does that require a restart, or it would, it no? would be an opinion of the lawyer to decide whether or not it would be a substantive change? If we're only talking about separating paragraphs, then I feel pretty comfortable that's not a substantive change. But if you're looking at changing wording, then I would need an opinion from the lawyer of whether or not that would constitute the requirement to go back to our first reading. We all, I think we all agree on the intention of the wording. It would just be a matter of making sure it's reading the way we intend okay. it to yeah. be. Yeah, I think yeah. you just need to uncouple them. Because if you read yeah. it, if you don't read it with the period there, it does look like if you can't meet 1.8, you got to build a temporary sidewalk. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it counts graves. So further than that, I mean, uh, for, um, 
This, here it says the um, heritage officer should be. Which number is that, Councilor Grace? Uh, two, two A. Why would the heritage officer be included in? There are areas in town that have um, heritage controls. So the one would be, there's a condition here that the sidewalk cafe um, needs to sort of fit into its surroundings. So for instance, if we have like a heritage control area, and like an architectural control area, mm -hmm. the sidewalk cafe, if a building has requirements how it must look, the sidewalk cafe should have a similar okay. look and feel. So the heritage officer would be, in this case, our heritage officer is also our development officer, but that may not always be the case. So that individual has an opportunity to review to ensure that they are content with the, the plan. Okay, and, and one other one, just for number 22, has outdoor uh, propane heaters been considered, or is that, could that be an issue? They were just not explicitly discussed. No. Um, I'm not sure if our town engineer and also our traffic authority. <laughs> so thinking of really May and October, you know, some of those long, long later months. There's nothing in this bylaw that would prevent that. Okay. I'm not sure if our town engineer is aware of any other bylaws or regulations that would prevent. If we've received a request, we would we would do the appropriate research to ensure, but there's okay. nothing in here that would prevent that. Okay. So without changing any wording, we're we're good to kind of maybe separate that and move on to second reading, provided that we obviously pass first reading. Mm -hmm. So someone pre is prepared to make a motion? Or did, did we make a motion? We, 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 we made we a motion. Did. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Questions <laughs> being called. All those in favor? Excellent. Motion's carried. Our next item is tender 17-01E, street line marking. Mr. Feener, do you have, are you presenting on this or just yes, your worship. I can I can highlight it. Um, we received two tenders on May the fifth for the painting of all our street line markings. Uh, we evaluated them based on the six criteria listed in the uh, tender in the document. I believe council had asked for some additional information regarding the use and the cost of the sharrows. Uh, we reviewed a number of different documents, including the design report uh, sections of the Motor Vehicle Act. Uh, the manual for the bikeway traffic control guidelines and a previous legal opinion and concluded that the placement of the sharrows conforms with these documents. Uh, the cost of just the sharrows and the associated parking symbols is about $2,500. The uh, budget for uh, street line painting is 44000 and we are recommending that it be awarded to the lowest um, price being Provincial Pavement Markings, Inc. Right. So I'm prepared to make that motion. Can I? Councilor Graves? Yes. Questions? yes, absolutely. So when does it, when does the marking start? Uh, once the award is given, which potentially could be as early as tomorrow, uh, the paint uh, is about two to three weeks away, and they would start after that. So mid-June. So this is pre-approved every year now, I think going on year three or four. How do we go about getting markings earlier in May? So just because it makes the town look nicer and, uh, or is that a problem or? I guess I'm not sure this particular spring has been wet, so I'm not sure there's been uh, much of an advantage this particular mm -hmm. year. Uh, the other thing I guess is the sooner that it's down, the sooner they wear off. So in the fall we tend to see the condition of the, of the markings deteriorate. So, so it's kind of a, I guess a balance. So is there a quality of paint issue? Are we paying, are we, I don't know what the levels of paint are, but I'm sure there's some paint that lasts a lot, a lot longer. It, it, quality has changed uh, mm -hmm. as environmental uh, rules and regulations um, um, come more into yeah. effect. The quality, of course, decreases, or I shouldn't say quality, but the, how long it lasts. So, for example, you know, oil paints tend to be going out, latex is more, more, uh, more popular. Mm -hmm. um, we follow the Scotia transportation paint specifications um, so I'm not sure we could reach out and use any better quality okay. product okay Councilor McDonald um, I noticed when 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 everything is broken down into individual units that um, some contractors have a really great price on uh, long stretches of painting whereas other ones had really great pricing on um, some of the, the smaller work like stop bars um, 
arrows, crosswalks, things like that. Could those be separated or would that create such small tenders that you wouldn't get any response because it's small? <laughs> it's, the tender's issued as a package um, mm -hmm. and, and it's broken out into units more or less so that if we tend to miss one in the quantities or we add something that we can go back and get that unit price tender. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think it's, it's done in probably the most cost effective way that we can do it. Okay. That's a Durbin. More to Jennifer's point because I looked at that and, and I see here just one item that stood out to me was uh, Crosswalk, a solid bar, company A, 100 bucks, company B, $16. And there's quite a few of those wide discrepancies that uh, there's no reason to understand why there would be that much fluctuation. Uh, uh, normally, um, we see the difference in the center line because some yeah. people, yeah. Uh, some contractors subcontract it out. Yes. So I could, you know, certainly yeah. foresee yeah. changes yeah. there, but normally the smaller jobs are done in house. So yeah. I'm not sure why the difference. Yeah. yeah. Anyway happens to be the lower price, I think. Mm -hmm. Some prepared to put a motion on the floor? I move that town council for the town of Bridgewater endorse the recommendation of staff and award tender 17-01E street line marking to the lowest bidder, Provincial Pavement Markings, Inc. at a cost of $44,402.94, including HST $40,266.13 net HST for the painting of top bars, crosswalks, center line, lane lines, yellow islands, arrows, parking stalls, firefighter symbols, bicycle and parking symbols as outlined in document 17-083. Seconder, Councilor Thorburn, any further discussion? Question. Question being called, all those in favor? Motion is carried. Uh, business arising, unfinished business. We have the request for financial support and partnership from the Lumberjacks. This was an item we, um, we did set aside the funds in our budget for this. Um, as we were waiting for some information and then uh, a time to have the discussion on their request, which is um, $15,000 in their documentation that they've sent. And so there is no motion in your package because we're going to have to discuss what, if anything, we'd like to do and then come up with that. So I'll open the floor to discussion. Councilor McGinnis. Would you like to have a motion up front? Sure. And if we get a second, or we'll talk about it. Perfect. I'm, <laughs> I move the town council of town of Bridgewater approve a fifteen thousand dollars sponsor sponsorship package for the South Shore Lumberjacks Hockey Club for 2017-18 hockey season. Second. All right. Motion is on the floor. If you will, your Absolutely. worship, I'll, I'll, I'll indicate. Obviously, I'm in support of this uh, for many reasons, not the least of which I'm a bit of a hockey fan. Not such a great hockey player, but a hockey fan. Uh, there are many reasons why we should look at doing this. Uh, not the least of which most teams in the league receive help from the towns that they're in. Indeed, the town of Edmonston uh, presented a financial package to the dean team that was in Dieppe, New Brunswick, just to attract them to Edmonston. Uh, when the team first came to Bridgewater, and I'm, I'm guessing probably between seven or eight years ago, uh, our town lobbied for this team, and indeed we did some significant renovations to the old arena to accommodate them, because we've seen the benefits of that. Uh, in addition to, and there is an economic spinoff, and I, I think they gave a document that says what, around $700,000 a year uh, for, as an economic spinoff, but there's much more to it than that. Uh, you have, my guess is 95% of the players on that team are not from this area. They're young men that are going to university uh, and, uh, or high school in some cases. And they come here, they live, uh, they're billeted here, and they have great memories of this place. And they oftentimes uh, uh, go back home. And when I say back home, I'm talking New England, Ontario. There was a player here from out west, uh, from all over Atlantic Canada. Uh, it, it, this is a, a significant, uh, significant draw. I can tell you there are three towns in the province of Nova Scotia that are lobbying to have this hockey team go to where they are and giving a hell of a lot more than $15,000 because they'd like to have them in their town. It provides a, a big form of entertainment for a lot of residents in our town at a time of year when there's not much happening in town. Every Friday night is hockey night and you'll see anywhere from 600 to 1,200 people in the LCLC. 
which, you know, the lumberjacks are a major tenant. Uh, that is a huge draw for them. Uh, we have a gentleman who has invested a significant amount of money in this hockey club uh, and loses a significant amount of money every year to have it in this town. And uh, obviously he, he's a, a, I like to call him a hockey nut, but he's, he's also, you know, puts his money where his mouth is. So I think for many, many reasons, this is a great investment for us. Uh, and I'll leave it at that in case I have to speak again. The seconder like to? To follow up on that, I, I was talking to a lady that I played pickleball with, and, and Bill, you're not that great at pickleball. I guess you don't play it anyway, but anyway, she forms a bond with the billets that she has, and she traveled to Charlottetown, she traveled to Amherst, and she traveled to Florida to watch the billets play. And a couple of them was transferred, so they're still coming back. So once those friendships are established, the players keep coming back. And the bonds grow stronger. And, and it's nice to see that, that you would billet somebody and then travel to another province to watch them play. And the friendship grows, so I, I will be supporting that also. Any more discussion? Councilor Graves. Just a comment. In the 14-15 year, the corporate sponsorships were $33,306. So I take it, and that's for, the, that's for a full year. So the, the corporate sponsorship is the business community. It's only part of the year. Yeah, July 1st of June. No, I know the statement says, but there's a note there that says the corporate bond is available in the future. Any other discussion? Councilor McDonald? Um, I just wanted to note on, on top of the, the positive points that have already been shared, um, the Lumberjacks have a volunteer program. They're very active in the community, very involved in, in what's happening in the town of Bridgewater. They really give back to the community, as well as being um, excellent role models for the, the young athletes in the community, whether they play hockey or other sports. Um, they, they see them and they see them achieving at these levels. They, they can come out on Friday night and support their, their team. And uh, I think it really sets a great example for, for some of our local athletes who will hopefully go on to do big things and some of them will be lumberjacks. Councilor Frazier. I just wanted to ask if this was just uh, a one year ask, do we it know? Is. Okay, so it's not committing us to no. a future no, it's it's one year ask, and the motion is just for the 17-18 hockey season. Anyway. Look, I would suggest you're setting a bit of precedent by approving this. That it's, it probably will not be a one year ask, unless of course attendance goes goes mm -hmm. higher every year. Uh, I'm I'm not clear on um, what we're getting in exchange. I guess I am clear on what they're proposing, but I'm not clear on why the town of Bridgewater would perhaps want some of the items and if, if that is open for discussion if we know with the team I don't know if it's open for the team I do share similar concerns for example um, six season ticket packages I wouldn't want those for us I would hope that if that's part of the what we get that those would be distributed to those who would who could use them sure. yeah, uh, sure. lower income families yeah. or, or people that could not yeah. necessarily afford to go to a game I wouldn't want them for us, but I, we could we could ask some questions for sure. Yeah. I'm sure they're open to it. Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly. I, you know, a lot of the stuff that they're offering, it's, it's valuable to a lot of uh, corporate uh, sponsors, not to us. Right. I think the value to us is having the team in this town, which you know, and and on a Friday night, you I'll talk to people here from Liverpool, Shelburne, Chester, all coming here. I've talked to the parents of a lot of the kids who are playing that team. There's one lady who has a kid from North Bay, Ontario, who plays in this hockey team. She spent three weeks here last year just to see her son play hockey. And uh, so it's, uh, it's important. I, uh, I'll be supporting the motion because I, I did uh, receive the presentation that they gave that said that, uh, and it was done by an outside firm. It wasn't done by the Lumberjacks. It did say that uh, approximately $787,000 is generated in our uh, community just by having the Lumberjacks there. So uh, I'm interested to see what $15,000 does. Um, if there's an ask next year, I'd like to see some numbers on 
uh, how attendance went up, how revenues went up. Um, that will be, for me, the deciding factor for next year because if nothing changes, then I'm not sure it's money well spent, but I'm, I'm prepared for myself to, to invest in something that generates almost a million dollars worth of economic activity in the area. Just a comment about that number. I'm sure it's a lot lower than that. I would imagine that the majority of the people are from New Germany or, or Day Spring or Bridgewater, and they're, just, and they're coming to the game, and they're leaving and going home. And if they were coming and picked up gas in the town of Bridgewater, it's because they needed it anyways. So I would imagine, I'd like to know how many people are from out of town that would require a stay over. That would be, that would be a nice number to have, you know? Anybody can write and put whatever number they want at the end of the well, and, and to your point, I think that for major events at the LCLC in general, it would be nice to know where people are coming from. So when it's the 55 plus games or whether it's another sledge hockey tournament, it would be nice to have some kind of survey of that. We did do that survey for the sledge hockey that got back to you, and I think that was somewhere around a million dollars for that four day. But in, in fairness to Bill, there's a lot of people with family playing hockey that I, I met a couple of guys from husband and wife from Cape Breton when I was there one night. So they do travel here, they do stay here, and I think that number is more accurate than not, personally. All right, anything, any further discussion? Question. Question. Questions being called, all those in favor? Motion is carried. Um, our last item is 132 St. Philip Street. Um, this was an ad, uh, item that was added, and the town has reviewed the contents of the agreement in camera, and the next step is to authorize the execution of an agreement to purchase lands um, situated at 132 St. Philip Street. And um, if someone is prepared to, to make a motion. Yes, Your Worship, I move Town Council of Town of Bridgewater authorize the ex execution of an agreement to purchase land situated at 132 St. Philip Street at a price of $37,000 and authorize staff and a town solicitor to execute all necessary documents to complete the purchase. Is there a second or Councilor okay. Silverman, any discussion? Hearing none, you ready for the question? Question. Question being called, all those in favor? The motion is carried. We are uh, at the end of our agenda and so I would like a motion to uh, <laughs> motion to adjourn. Absolutely. We are adjourned. Really? No one can.